Hello, and welcome to the fourth episode of Character Witness. Today I'm joined by Mac, who's going to take us through a couple of her characters, and we're going to explore things like how it was for them DMing, um, what the characters mean to them, stuff like that. So would you like to introduce yourself and tell everyone a bit about yourself? For sure. Um, hi, my name is Mac. I obviously don't have a British accent. I am from Texas in the United States. Um, and I have been playing since probably this time last year. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I, I had moved back from living in a different city and I'd been interested in it. And I'd been part of an online campaign that kind of fell apart. I feel like everybody's done that. Yeah. <laughs> I was part of a campaign that didn't really work out. Like I think that's a given. Um, and I was invited to a 3.5 campaign that was already pretty established. And I started a 13th level character, which, is, which retroactively, I'm like, this was insane for it to be like my first experience. That sounds like so much to keep track of, like oh right away. <laughs> I had, so I had a very limited experience with 5th edition. Yeah. And no experience with any previous editions. Um, and I, I guess I can talk about that first. Um, yeah. His name uh, was, mm, oh God, I don't even remember now. Um, um, what in the, what was just his give name? Give a really pedestrian it? name just for the, the purpose uh, of it, but we'll just call him Derek or something. <laughs> for sure, yeah. <laughs> he was actually, um, I, you know, like any other uh, <laughs> member of the LGBT, I played a monstrous race. Yeah. Um, I played an orc, and a full orc um mondul that was his name sorry mondul manhunter and i kind of went the whole like you know uh super uh, involved backstory and stuff where he was yeah. abandoned when he was young and like got adopted by humans and so they gave him the name manhunter it's kind of a joke um mechanically he was a 13th level fighter which at 3.5 is a lot stronger just because of how it's balanced yeah um, and I actually, that's why I have, the, um, the, my, this tattoo of a double orc axe, of uh, orc double axe. I forget what it's actually called. Is it not but called I have, a great axe? Uh, oh, with the two no, things it's at the the, end. a completely different thing. Oh, okay. Um, it's a double headed axe and each head has two blades. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Okay. And gosh, like thinking back on it, like I'm DMing a fifth edition campaign now mm -hmm. and looking at my action economy of my 13th level character, because I mean, it's different in 3.5, yeah. but it's just insane to think about it objectively. I had five attacks and six attacks if I uh, killed somebody with that feet cleave in yeah. 3.5. And because uh, because I had like an insane setup, I had like mithril plate of speed, and <laughs> that worked double axe, and that was holy, and just the combination of, it was insane. It was insane. Um, I was getting six attacks pretty much every round because you know I was doing so much damage. Um, Sounds disgusting. It was fun. It was just like a lot to. It was a lot for my first experience. Yeah. Um, and the group I played with was more of like a dungeon crawler type group. They didn't really get into the role play, which, you know, I understand that's some people's style, but yeah. I, it's hard for me to really get with that. So with, uh, with that, with you not really getting into the role play aspect that much, it was more of like a dungeon crawler. We have objectives that to do them. Did you find yourself not being as attached to your characters, like later ones where you did get a role play or were you just attached to the character because you put so much into the backstory anyway? <laughs> um, I had, I had attachment to him initially. And then, um, the DM of that game kind of like the setting we were in, I think it might be a popular module. I'm not sure, yeah. but it's just this multi-level prison. Ah, okay. And it is, massive it's expansive it, it's almost never ending and the group i played with was very meticulous about let's explore every room every floor we want to get we want to get everything taken care of 
It sounds like my dad playing video games. Like, say if he, he <laughs> whenever I, like he'd take the consoles off us so he could play it like later in the evening, he wouldn't leave a room until he was sure. And his catchphrase, my mom used to make fun of him for it because uh, he used to just say, "Is there anything to pick up?" Like that was <laughs> all he would say to himself. Like he was, he was like going through rooms. He's like he'd be playing like a shooter, which doesn't require anything but like health pickups, and he'd be on full health, and he'd still want to pick them up just compulsively. Uh, I... So. Uh... <laughs> He's an odd one, my dad. That's insane. I had to stop playing Skyrim like that. Like I used to play, I used to play Skyrim when I was younger. Yeah. And um, I just I got so wrapped up there. I'd spend like an hour just like smithing and, and breaking stuff down and reforging it and like selling it. Like, ugh, I hate, I hate, I hate thinking about playing like that. I hate games with too many side things to do because I know I'm gonna get trapped in the side things and get bored of the game. Right. I mean, I'm surprised that I managed to complete The Witcher because there's so much to do in that, but jeez. So, going back to uh, your character, uh, did you, with the, the character, obviously you got that tattoo and everything, you really liked the the whole orc thing. Um, mm-hmm. Did you carry him over into other campaigns, or was it a case of, like, you left him contained to that one and then the next campaign you used someone new? Because everyone I know... They haven't counted so far, anyway, on the podcast and whoever I play, uh, play with in real life. They usually use a new character for, like, every campaign. But apparently, I've been looking online, just, like, talking to people, just gauging, like, what they do with characters. And there's some people who use, like, the same character across multiple campaigns, which I don't really get, because what if it's a completely <laughs> different world? <laughs> like, but, yeah. Um, well, that's the thing is, I mean, I, I I post on Twitter and you supported me, which I was very happy about, about talking yep. about, like, homebrewing various things like per your D D universe or your game, whatever it be. Yeah. Um, and I think that's a big thing is, I mean, you say, <laughs> going on our D D or our DMs guild. Uh, like, I feel like every week you get a post where it's like, yeah, one of my players has like an amulet of health and they're level three and, uh, <laughs> you know, like yeah. a rod, uh, uh, in immobility or whatever it's called. Immovable rod. Oh, speaking of immovable rods just like uh, not to inject or anything but my character in our current campaign he used to use a bow staff but we found an immovable rod so now he uses the immovable rod as a bow staff (laughs) and that managed to save all we got on this rickety old ship that got attacked by tentacles and it would have sank but i managed to just hook the the rod underneath the ship on some benches on like the bottom deck and just click the immovable rod so it wouldn't sink (laughs) anyway but yeah back to (laughs) so funny but, like, you see that post, like, all the time about, you know, like, one of my players brought this broken shit in yeah. because they said they got it from their last campaign. And I'm just like, no offense, but, like, grow a spine and tell them no. Like, <laughs> that's all you can do. Uh, yeah, I agree. But, like, that, that, just the whole concept of that situation even got at that point is odd to me because wouldn't you, like, I know as me, as a player, I'd be more considerate, come in and say, look, I've got this can I use it in your campaign? I would just walk in and go, here's the fucking no. sword of a million storms, it's my family's sword, it kills everything in one hit. How are we doing today, boys? And it's like, I'm just, like, different people's worlds are so varied. Like, you have yeah. DMs really enjoy magic and have a high magic universe. Mm-hmm. You have other DMs who enjoy a lower magic universe where, like, magic is very impactful and very yeah. rare. And so, like... And that radically alters the items that you're going to find and use in that campaign. And so to bring in something from a different campaign, a different world, usually, is very, (laughs) you know, it's a game. But in that context, it really kind of messes with the fabric of that reality. I feel um, as though like you've got to establish a good relationship with your DM to like see how how much rope they're going to give you. And then I do you listen to um Critical Role? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think then there's even a there's even a fucking YouTube video on this, which I think is fantastic. Yeah. Um, that talks about how Travis Willingham, who played Grog in the first season and who plays Fjord in the second season, yeah, um, is a fantastic player. And this YouTube video talks about like how he's one of the best D players because he asks if he can do things. Yeah. He accepts when the DM tells him either no or we'll do it this time, but we'll do it like this in the future. Yeah, yeah. Like completely he has fun 
but he goes along with what the DM says. Mm. And I think that a lot of people <laughs> would do well to watch that or listen to that just because of how Travis interacts with Matt in that context. Yeah, it was sort of Is like it... uh, in the early episodes when uh, they still had um, Orion there and he was like talking all kinds of shit. Like, I'm going to do 50, 50 million backflips and summon 100 draconian knights. And everyone <laughs> at the table was like, uh... <laughs> Matt had to be like, yeah, may- maybe we can't do that. But yeah, I find it just the consideration going both ways has like helped me form my characters because it's like it also helps me to reel things in because like I'm speaking to Mike, my DM, like every now and then I'll get like this harebrained scheme to do something, but even so, I'll go out like Mike, <laughs> stop me if this is god modding or whatever, but can I try this? And he'll go, no, that's ludicrous. Or yeah, but we'll have this many checks for it. Like I, I, I maybe it's just because I'm a polite person, but I've never understood people who just say they're doing things without consideration to the story. So it's just like I, I, I tell I tell my players don't metagame. Yeah. Because, and there is a difference. I've talked about the differences between like metagaming and power gaming. Power yeah. gaming, totally. If you find a really good combo that really in character, yeah. like. You know, one character casts a spell and another character is like, hey, if you cast that spell and I do this, then we can do this. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Yeah. But like, no, I'm going to choose this subclass because you chose that subclass. And then later on, we can do this. No. Yeah. You are not allowed to do that. And I tell my players, if you do metagame, I will punish you because that is not how, I guess that's not how I play. But I, I, I also think that's like, it's more fun to kind of naturally form both a rapport and like a f- cohesion yeah. in the game, as opposed to just, you know, exploiting every broken combo, mm-hmm. which yeah. to be fair, the edition has very, very few of those. But it's like, um, cause the one where it's like, if you do this, I'll do this and we'll see if it works. That's improv, which is an essential part of the game. But like planning like 50 sessions ahead to like, maybe one day we'll be able to do this magical spell. is just manipulation of like the game mechanics right like way far in the future and it's unfair to the dm because like yeah they got, a sh- they got shit to do man they gotta kind of fuck you up a little bit because that's mean, the game you just ask it to be punished because you're like oh once we get a level 12 we could do this and the dm's just gonna be like right he has a monster and it's gonna kill one of you <laughs> here's a wizard with three level nine spell slots oh and they're just gonna use a reaction to cast spell against you yeah also, he's got two other minions that are also going to cast counters against you. Fuck you. <laughs> like, they can totally play in Like, it, I don't... Yeah. I don't know. I don't... But, um... Uh... D- I, I, I DM'd as well. I kind of started DM along the way yeah. uh, when I was doing that 3.5 campaign, and I've really enjoyed that. So, to go back to your characters... Um, we've got a mm-hmm. picture on the screen. Well, you can't see. You can't see my screen because we're on Discord. But <laughs> we've got the first picture here, and it is of what looks to be an orc person. Yes. Is this the um, orc from your first campaign? Is it an orc from another campaign? Is he even full orc? Is he half orc? <laughs> he is full orc. Um, he is actually um a player character I had made that I turned into an NPC. Yeah. Um, this is I I just remember this is actually, um. I created another NPC, uh, mm-hmm. another character, excuse me, um, who is a half orc cleric. And then I, doing some like fleshing out of this character's backstory, I was like, well, who are his parents? Yeah. And that's where this guy came from. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, this is uh, the father of another character I've made. But this orc in particular, his name is Vaku uh, Bloodbone. Okay. And he he has a twin, uh, Vograk, and they are a pair of smithing. Uh, they're a pair of smiths that yeah. live in my universe in the town of Tribor. Um, and they have actually, they've actually encountered the players and um, he is, I believe I made uh, Vaku the uh, metal smith and carpenter of the twin. Okay. And, um, so he makes a lot more weapons, whereas his brother makes armor and uh, other armaments, shields, etc. Put shoes on um, horses and stuff. Yeah, exactly. And this was, um, I'll actually shout out the artist. Um, I've got her email pulled up. Nice. Uh, her, I, I don't remember her actual Instagram um, or her whatever page she published this on. I actually found her on Reddit. 
Um, mm. But her, uh, her, I guess, brand name is Haley Olivia Art. Okay. Um, and she's the uh, artist of this fine, fine young man. Excellent. Um, yeah, and I'm very, very happy with this rendition of him. That's very good. Yeah, I like it a lot. And I like this style of kind of, of like the classic fantasy art as opposed to a more, I guess, cartoony style that I see yeah. popularized, like popularized with Hero Forge and other artistic mediums. It looks like, like a, a concept art you find back when they still put character portraits in video game manuals before they decided <laughs> exactly. to be eco-friendly, those, <laughs> those bastards. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm always je jealous of people who can draw hands properly, so... <laughs> limbs why are they so hard um i'm trying to draw too just so i can kind of get some more yeah. uh representations of the things that i envision in my universe yeah it's really frustrating for like me as as a person personally because i'm like i've got all these cool ideas but no artistic talent unfortunately all of that right. went into my brother I... um <laughs> so i'm like oh this would look so cool if i had any talent whatsoever yeah so what was the sort of inspiration behind him like was he inspired by any sort of like blacksmiths and other fantasy was he is he based on anyone you know in real life anything like that hmm. um i think he's kind of honestly like a, a i guess a self insert to a degree yeah um i am looking at currently going into carpenting um and i just i really like working with my hands and would prefer yeah. to do that the current job where I'm in food service uh, and other jobs where I've been in retail or food service. Um, and so the idea, I guess, of, of metalwork and woodwork both really appeal to me. Yeah. Um, obviously, it just kind of came from thinking about who that other character's parents were and then kind of through that fleshed this person out a little bit more. Um, I, I don't know if there was any real life inspiration or... or yeah inspiration uh I, I definitely like humanizing orcs more because i feel like a lot of that yeah excuse me a lot of the old uh, ideals of uh various quote-unquote monstrous races or, or non-human races yeah were influenced heavily by racism and and a lot of those racial stereotypes are yeah, absolutely kind of recontextualized in the in the D, D universe which i think is like those are good conversations to have and they're happening more now yeah um, but you still have people that are like yeah all orcs are evil and uh, you're gonna kill the orc and they've all got they all all they care about is war and they run in large tides and threaten regular civilization civilization in quotation marks um yeah. but yeah it's like uh, not e like even past the, the racism thing like you've got other races like um dwarfs always like the stereotype of like uh, either Irish or Scottish drunks, which is their stereotype in real life, and it's like, come on, lads. <laughs> it's 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 a strange and then place elves to be. Are so perfect and beautiful. I'm like, come on, like it's so on the nose. It's so obvious. <laughs> I think my my aversion to elves when I was a child, sort of like, I wouldn't say radicalized me against them, but I've always just disliked elves, even though I technically mm -hmm. like my current character is a wood elf. I feel like wood elves are just like. They just happen to be elves, but they just they live in the forest. They're not too worried about Which... oppressing people. But like right. I, I do it like when I was growing up, like it's the reason larger the reason why I don't care about Legend of Zelda. I know like I don't think Link's an actual elf, but he looks like one. I, I don't yeah. know if that's <laughs> video game racist of me, but like so but and when I was little I was like, I don't care about being a little elf boy in the forest. Like I wanna shoot lasers at my hands i care about superheroes like i don't and like whenever mm -hmm. there's like um like lord of the rings everyone's like wow legolas is so talented i'm like yeah but i like someone to be more rough around the edges i much prefer like Gimli or aragorn like they just seem so all like haughty and like above other people and like specifically above other races like yeah you know elves are and, and you know tolkien did inspire this i think yeah the kind of longevity of elves versus uh humans even dwarves even like uh, in D, D halflings and in the tolkien lore uh hobbits um they're just like longer lived and so kind of 
pseudo philosophical in that regard where they think themselves to be above others because they live so much longer than them. Yeah, so they're well, lobsters, they can't die unless they're killed. So <laughs> I've learned so much more. I've seen so much more than you have, and that's what makes me better. It's sort of like, like to me, they represent like just old people in institution like institutions that are outdated because like oh we know right. we know best this has been in place for 300 years and then they're all they're always rigid they refuse to change their point of view and then show up at the last minute when they're like okay maybe everyone else was right it's like yeah <laughs> yeah they're like boomers as a race essentially exactly they're 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 <laughs> mythical sprinkly boomer people who live in ivory towers and stuff <laughs> Plus, like, everything else just seems more fun. Like, it, everyone else has more character to them, whereas elves always seem to be, like, just one thing. And when people make characters out of, like, elves, they usually, like, add flavor to them because they need to add flavor to them rather than, like, say, an orc. Like, because they're an orc, they obviously have that uniqueness right away. But an elf <laughs> is, like, is like, yeah, he's going to be, like, floaty, blonde, f- just being an arse to people. But the one time I did DM a campaign at work, like after work, a couple of sessions didn't last because like people had different shifts and stuff. But there was a guy I work with called Andrew. Shout out to Andrew. I don't want to use his surname in case he's iffy about internet security, but (laughs) (laughs) he played he played an old wizard elf who was extremely like he he referred to the other party members as the help, and I was like, yes, that's exactly how an elf would be. That's so funny. Yeah, it was, he was. Too, I hated his character, but in in a good way, oh, yeah. obviously. But yeah, <laughs> it was. Uh, but he's just like an elf, so he's like really fragile. Like he's exactly what you what like old institutionalized like rigid people are. They're like, oh no, well, we don't want to get our own hands dirty, but we still know better type thing. Um, exactly, that's quite good. So, on top of like the so the orc, the blacksmith. He's mm-hmm. um, did he? I know he's a non-player character in that campaign, but did he have any like motives past his work? Like, say, did he ever need something from the party, or was he just sort of there to facilitate like items and stuff? Um, I definitely wanted like kind of a you know a personal. I thought that was important to introduce, and yeah. you know, character that I, you know, had an attachment to and could really give character to more than. Uh, an NPC that I had improvised. Yeah. Um, he actually, <laughs> in the beginning, I remember I'd telling you about um, um, when I first started DMing and more than half of my party, which was four people, three of them just left um, because they, you know, couldn't commit to it or had things come up, whatever it would be. Um, I, I put him with the party yeah. because they did need some help because of the area they were going to. I Like, I knew reading the book there were going to be some issues. Yeah. They were not going to be able to fully take care of themselves. And rather than water down the encounters, I figured, I'll just put a higher level NPC with you. It'll kind of affect the CR you're able to compete with. Yeah. Um, and in characterization with him, like, he used to be... He and his brother used to hunt and kill uh, beasts and other uh, kind of lower level bothers to towns when they were younger. Yeah. Um, And uh, he kind of had that taste for adventure still, even after um, he had his son. And that was another part of it was he was eager. His brother was not. And so he just left and, and went with them. And he actually, I think, had the the. I'm playing uh, the Lost Minds of Fandelver campaign, so I guess spoilers yeah. if you're playing that, or <laughs> whatever. It would be if you want to play. This is fairly minor. It's not going to affect overall yeah. uh, your campaign experience. But in the town of Thundertree, like early on in the campaign, um, there's a dragon that's hiding in a tower, and I'm very much like like opposed to make your players avoid an encounter thing. Like, fuck no. They're going to try and kill the dragon. (laughs) So he actually, I think, if I'm remembering correctly, got the killing blow on it because of the, uh, like, initiative order and whatever. 
one of them had one of my players had a scroll of fireball that was given to them by the campaign i was like well fuck <laughs> it is kind of like the whole shit yeah. um, it was it was fun though it was cool excellent mm -hmm. oh, i'm glad he got his got his uh his final blow in his taste right. adventure hopefully fully sated by able to say he defeated an empire dragon <laughs> ragged rights as well yeah you go back and tell his brother about you should have come along could have saw me right so the next thing we're going to talk about is the next character you've got for me, which looks like a tiefling. I don't want to assume Indeed. that it is a tiefling, because it's something. Because I, I thought my like uh, one of I think it was the first episode. I was talking to my friend Ryan. I thought he was like a bloated corpse because he's like, and it had been reanimated because his skin was blue. I thought, he, and he's like his gimmick. Oh, he, okay. He's a pirate, <laughs> so I thought he like drowned and then was brought back to life. He's like, no, I'm an edge and nasty. I was like, oh god, I'm fantasy racist. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. well yeah those are when you're hitting like that that's where a lot of people's knowledge falters so like you know yeah because i, I <laughs> don't know anything about extended yeah. editions like extra um, races and stuff so but she is a tiefling nice. um this is the first her, her name is akoda uh yeah. as uh displayed on the character art um which this is actually the campaign that i'm playing yeah um not as a DM, as a player with a new group of people. And I'm going to shout out uh, my fellow party member. Um, his name is Anthony, and his uh, Instagram username is uh, at Grim underscore Jack. Nice. Let me make sure I'm typing that out right. <laughs> <laughs> um, where are my messages? How do I access my messages? I don't know. Um, direct messages. Here we go. Sorry. Um, yeah, Instagram. Oh, sorry. Grim underscore ink is his instagram okay. um so uh hit him up if you want some commissions or some portraits because this one is really cool i really enjoyed it he actually just kind of i didn't even realize he was his character was like busy guarding kobolds i think and didn't actually get to come down and, and participate in combat with us yeah so this is what he was doing during that encounter which i thought was nice. amazing Excellent. um and uh, Akoda is a younger tiefling. She's about, I think, 16 or 17, if I'm correct. Um, and in this universe that our DM has, she lives in the town of Enwick, mm -hmm. uh, which is mostly a human-populated town. And she grew up, two tiefling parents who moved to, to try and find work. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, has had her fair share of scraps, you know, being called a demoness or, a, a, you know, yeah. L, whatever it would be. Um, and she is a wizard. She actually studied under the, the local wizard from the town um, who caught her trying to steal a spell book and said, you know what? Yeah. Don't let her punish her. I'll just teach her since she wants to learn. So um, I, I like her a lot. I haven't, I've kind of tried to steer away from giving new characters that I make a lot of backstory. Yeah. Just because, you know, as a DM, I've I've learned that when your players bring an insane amount of backstory, sometimes it's hard to incorporate it or really pay attention to it. And a lot of times it's easier to bring a, a kind of rather uh, regular character and then have mm -hmm. them form their story through the campaign. I yeah. much prefer it. Oh, I feel like it's okay if like they bring a lot of backstory that isn't entrenched in a specific world so like it might be like three pages about like their moral code or whatever like that's fine because oh, it doesn't yeah. affect the world that like the dm's making but like they say i grew up in this specific town and this cataclysm happened and the dm's like okay i guess this happened in my world without me right. noticing i guess <laughs> and then another player's like well i lived over there and you like went through a cataclysm at one point <laughs> everyone's parents got shot in an alleyway and now we're all Batman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so... Um, so with her being, like, a, like he's, so he's grew up in a human population, gotten some scraps and stuff, did she ever accidentally kill another child with a hellish rebuke? Uh, no. <laughs> um, I do, um, in my description of her, um, which I'm hoping to draw at some point, um, her horns are actually... Uh, connected kind yeah. of i guess brow style um mm. and she has some scars and scratches on her horns yeah. um from like headbutting people <laughs> <laughs> that pissed her off or mm. is tried to harass her cool 
so that's very um much like a ram <laughs> yes kind of, i mean you know not to be too much of a texan but um <laughs> kind of her horns are much smaller but i picture them more as like longhorn style yeah where they protect the sides and so her uh <laughs> her head is a battering ram but she prefers to she prefers to cast spells and maybe not get so many scars on herself anymore. So what was the decision behind making a, a wizard? Because a lot of the time, um, <laughs> tieflings are just like, ah, oh, I look like a demon, I'm going to be a necromancer. <laughs> <laughs> um, I We had talked about... Um, we, we metagamed a bit in our yeah. creation of our characters, but it was more so like getting party composition balanced as opposed to like the whole subclasses thing. Yeah. Um, so if I'm remembering correctly, we already had two barbarians who like were fine accompanying each other yeah. and chose different subclasses. And we had a cleric and some, some others. And so I was like, well, I really, I have, I hadn't ever played a caster. Mm -hmm. um, casting kind of confused me. So being an ambitious young lass, I was like, well, if, I might as well try it now because I was kind of keen to have more of an impact on the combat situation as opposed to enemy well-being, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I also, um, I think I sent you the character sheet, um, and I talked about making it an actual PDF as opposed to D and D Beyond. Yeah. Because I can only choose School of Evocation. Mm -hmm. um, I'm picturing her as being a school of abjuration and really kind of thinking about how to control the world around her and affect the people in it. Um, and that's something I'm kind of having difficulty with, is because I definitely make. I made chaotic good characters a lot when I was younger. Yeah, and she's definitely more of like a, like a lawful neutral or a neutral good even. Yeah, and uh, that's a little harder to play for me because I have to think as her and not myself. Yeah, um, she would generally not make super risky plays in order to save other people, um, but she definitely would expend a lot of resources in order to save herself. So it's a little, <laughs> it's a little uh, change of uh, play style for me. Do you think that's a result of uh, just the way she was brought up and stuff like that? So like she's trying to change and dictate the world around her because for a lot of the time before she became a wizard, she was just getting bullied. Probably. Um, I definitely, she, uh, her parents are still alive and still working yeah. as woodworkers. Um, and I, I picture... I envision, I guess, that her parents had their deal of harassment as well, being being tieflings in a mostly human city. Yeah. Uh, and so I, I, I see that she would protect them a lot. Um, and that might be where the drive to learn magic came from, yeah. uh, to protect herself or her parents. But uh, <laughs> I haven't fleshed out that far, I guess. But I mean, I mean, it makes sense in terms of her progression, because when you think about it, like it, they're all three of them getting harassed, but like say she can fight well, headbutt people. She can fight back mm -hmm. against it, use her magic and stuff, because there's less at stake for her. But like say if her parents try to like say anything or take a stand, they could lose their jobs and like not right. be able to provide. So it is it's quite interesting like base for a character, and especially how like you say she'd expend a lot of resources to preserve herself, which initially on the surface seems a bit selfish but it's a case of like it's likely i don't want to speak for the character but what the impression i get is because she was like oh if i snuff then no one's going to protect my family type thing right yeah and uh funnily enough the whole metagaming conversation we came to uh the, the dm was like well i want you to form a reasoning like a story behind why y'all know because I don't want to have the awkward first session where nobody knows Meet in the how tavern. to Meet in the tavern. <laughs> and then the, the you know somebody comes and gives us a quest. Um, he didn't he didn't want to do all that because, like I said before, these this group they'd all been playing, yeah, for generally longer than I have been alive, or mm -hmm. uh, if not that before I was born. So 
um, I respected that decision. And we formed this story that uh, one of the barbarians, he uh, is a like a cage fighter, like an arena fighter. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but we're all like gaming the system for him. Like oh, okay. I'm casting spells to affect either him or the other uh, enemies. Um, the bard is like providing him inspiration. Uh, the cleric is, you know, there for heals and stuff. So, like, just a really cool kind of. Uh, <laughs> That's really cool, actually. <laughs> right, like a con, essentially. I think it's really cool. And she, you know, she's younger, and so she's like, "Well, I don't know if this is the right thing, but like, I'm able to make this money." Then that's the yeah. thing is they all get cut of the winnings, and the bard is actually like the uh, barbarian's handler, and he's like totally shorting him on money, and the oh. barbarian doesn't know it. <laughs> so um, we're all getting a cut, and so she's like apprehensive about what she's doing, but really appreciates that money on the side since uh, she's not able to. To work yet so so with that with like um the bards shortchanging uh the barbarian the cage fighter um in that vein like it sounds like he hasn't discovered it yet but has there been any other instances where there's been friction within the party if you ever had a situation like that before not like real life heat between like two players who don't like each other I just mean like it's ever been <laughs> a case where you've made a decision and another one of the characters has just been entirely opposed to it or anything like that not really the barbarian is pretty amicable yeah um he doesn't seem to understand what's going on and <laughs> none of our characters are keen on uh convincing him otherwise uh i've thought about it like as me i've thought about akota saying something to them maybe in a heated moment of uh being irritated with the bard and i think she might be um <laughs> i think she would be irritated about them just because he is, uh, he's a bit haughty, but yeah, these are these are all in character interactions that are going to happen, um, that well are going to happen that have not happened yet that I've just kind of like given thought to, not necessarily planned out if that makes sense. Yeah. So what I well, obviously again you can't see my screen, but I've got your character sheet up here. So mm -hmm. I'm just looking at your stats, and it seems pretty in line with what a wizard would be built like, like minus one strength, which is fair, um, <laughs> no modifiers on dexterity, uh, right. plus one constitution, that's quite interesting. Um, does that come from any like natural bonus of being a tiefling, or was that a conscious decision to give yourself just a little more HP? I think they get a, what do they get a bonus to? I chose the base tiefling because... I know uh, one of them is charisma, isn't it? Because they've got like influence over people because they're demonic to a degree. Let me actually. Where's races? Here we go. I'm gonna actually look it up because I don't really remember. I don't either. So uh, that's fine. Oops. What's others? Tiefling. Here we go. Tiefling gets plus two to charisma and plus one to intelligence. Oh, okay. So, um, I think doing that we used um we used point by for oh, our okay. stat. So I willingly took the um hit to uh intelligence knowing i'd get the plus one same with charisma plus charisma is not going to be um my main stat so i, I didn't yeah. really put that much into it and obviously character wise being a tiefling i'm imagining like you know you're not the most charismatic um given your appearance generally has people have a, a predilection towards you or against you rather um so, well, I guess that's not fair to attribute to Tiefling. I would attribute it to her. She's not necessarily the most friendly or, yeah. like, kind of smoozy. She's just like, I'm going to talk to you, and whatever you think, you're going to think. So I took the hits to those, knowing the bonuses would either balance it out or not really matter. Yeah. Um, Constitution, though, I, again, a little metagamey, but I just, <laughs> being a fucking squishy class like i didn't want to be susceptible to um kind of the, the issue of getting shit hp rolls yeah getting so, picked off by a level level level. ranger character on the other team i mean you know I'm, I'm happy to make another character but i just <laughs> i uh i was afraid um i heard with the players being older than me yeah um they told me so much about like 
getting to level two as a wizard in first edition was like a slog and was like one of the hardest things ever. And you pretty much just had to be ready to reroll another character. Yeah. Um, so, and I'm, I'm feeling that a little bit in my first, in our first session, we had some combat and I used my two spell slots and then I couldn't really do anything. <laughs> and that was a, a hard spot to be in. But I think uh, that fits the class very well yeah like there's kind of that balance between the, the the dichotomy between casters and martial classes that are strictly one or the other um martial classes obviously have a higher success rate mm -hmm. but a lower payoff and then casting classes have the lower success rate but the higher payoff yeah. and i think uh, it's it's interesting to be able to play that uh as opposed to what I generally default to, which is the martial class. Yeah. So in the in the skill section, um, mm -hmm. it all looks pretty wizardy. You've got Arcana, history, investigation, like things you'd mm -hmm. expect from a wizard. You've also got the specialization in intimidation. Um, was that a conscious decision? Is it something you just get? And do you think that would be useful just to? play on like people in that world's prejudice against tieflings so, like sort of take advantage of that so if someone has this predisposition that you're a demon you could probably play into that to intimidate someone it's actually uh i think it's a the bonus from uh the tiefling i'm gonna actually look at it yeah uh, tiefling traits eternal legacy you know the thaumaturgy cantrip do it might just be from you, your tongue score. Oh, well, I, <laughs> I forget where it comes from, but um, I, I think I did think about that yeah. in terms of like being a, being a tiefling, having people already kind of have a, a prejudice against you, maybe taking advantage of that. Um, because, yeah, I, I'm thinking back to creating the character and, um it it would it didn't really make sense any other skill option that i had uh, yeah. for my background so i just chose intimidation yeah i mean in terms of things like that because i don't the only character i've played that sort of like people had a predisposed notion of was uh, um a half orc but it really wasn't mm. it wasn't that bad in in the world that um Mike had made like it, there's not much prejudice in his world, which is nice, I guess. So it it yeah, could yeah. be, even though it's currently over with demons, it could be seen as a utopia socially <laughs> at least. Um, but like, is that a, is that a large theme in, in your campaign? Do you, do you run into many people? I know our backstory is she's getting bullied and stuff like that. But like, once is it a sort of thing where most adults are okay, or is it everyone just hates you? Um, in the campaign I'm a part of, I haven't really experienced that that much yeah we haven't seen uh, a plethora of npcs yet okay um the it seems that the most interaction we've had is really with town guard um okay. it's it's kind of a how do i say like a large major city and then the outlands are kind of you know forbidden like mm. or, or, or taboo like you don't really head out of the city that much okay because it's so dangerous out there. We're we're part of a hex crawl campaign, so we're kind of mapping the hexes as we're exploring. And oh, okay, it, it's really interesting. I've never, I've obviously never done that before, and uh, it's cool to have a different style of campaign. Um, we're tasked with like managing resources a little better, and it's it's interesting. So with with like across your characters, even like when you're DM and in, in doing the NPC things. Um, do you make a, like is it conscious in your mind that these characters are representative of like the things you're dealing with in real life so like for instance in my episode like my current character the Chaffinch is just a proxy for me like he's <laughs> currently just traumatized to the hilt like everything that's happened to him in the past like few months it because what happened with my character um, is he went away from the party and came back but in that time all of them apart from one of the characters died so he's just oh, come, he's come back to all of his friends being dead. I mean, there was yeah. there was a couple of people in the party he didn't get on with, 
And one that one of the reasons he left is he kicked one in the face because they murdered someone in front of him who they questioned and he doesn't believe in killing people unnecessary. So okay. he so he went away from the party. So he came back with all this. Or even with the guy kicked in the face, um, he still had it unre- like he would have said if he knew he was gonna die, he would have said sorry type thing. And then he and he's he's just he's an orphan, not like a tragic Batman style orphan. Like he never knew his parents. He doesn't really care. Um, okay. But he was very, he's very, he was very contained on the island that they found him on. He didn't know dragons are real. He didn't know anything was real. And then within a space of like a few adventures, um, he saw a real dragon try to pull its head off because he thought it was some like Scooby Doo thing. It was a guy in a suit. And then, well, obviously he tries to pull his head off. It's just viscera and it's horrible. And he's like, ah, so he's traumatized by that. The party <laughs> cleric went down and died. And then, yeah. luckily, we had enough to buy a diamond and resurrect him. So within the space of his first adventure, he, he found out dragons are real and death is meaningless. So he went okay. from being like this young boy who wanted to be a superhero into being just a droning mess. And then obviously he went away after he had that disagreement with um, the guy who killed the, the prisoner they had. And they came back, mm-hmm. all his friends were dead. And he's had a couple of run-ins with the, the guy who killed them, but he could never quite get to him to fight him. So he's yeah. in this... And he's he's part mystic he's a he's a subclass of mystic and monk and okay. he's but he went to at the height of his trauma he went away from the party to learn like mystic arts just to like try and center his mind but it did the opposite thing so now he's not all there and he sees his dead friends and he talks to them so he's wow. just he's just I, I don't have that in real life i don't see ghosts or anything but like i used him as a proxy for like um everything i was dealing with at the time because when i was at the height of the campaign i was i wasn't in a good place i was depressed and stuff so i was using that to work things out it was quite good for me and i thought it was quite and we, we touched on it in my episode but like is there anything that you that you feel like that the characters go through that you yourself have to go through or anything like that um well i i I guess I neglected to mention it at the beginning, introducing myself. Um, but yeah. um, I'm, and yeah, uh, I identify as female. I use she/her pronouns, and mm-hmm. I obviously don't sound like a lot of uh, women, or or I don't sound like what people think a woman would sound like. Yeah, um, I haven't done hormones or, or taken anything to change physically or, or yeah anything of that sort, um, which. You know, I want to press like doesn't mean anything. Like my identity is still valid, regardless yeah. of that, etc. Um, but I, I, I've <laughs> I haven't actually come out to uh, the group that I play with. I've come out to the group that I DM because yeah. uh, uh, other players that are in the LGBT community, and I just I wanted to be comfortable in my game. Um, yeah, but that i mean there might be something to say of that like a lot of members of the lgbt community i feel gravitate towards you know the half orcs the tieflings the dragonborns whatever the the non-human race would be whatever it is yeah um uh, i think there's (laughs) i think there's that um but for the most part i think she's just uh (laughs) again kind of an idealized form yeah. of myself uh which is you know a bit strange because i said vaku the earlier orc character he's a self-insert um i definitely kind of appreciate being strong and i definitely present myself as more butch than femme yeah but i also i enjoy kind of femininity i i've got my ears pierced i um <laughs> i have this shirt that's a little short so i'm gonna make it into a crop top and yeah um, Playing with the fluidity of gender and gender production, I think, is something that's important to me. Um, yeah. So I, I explore that in my characters, essentially. I um, think, the, yeah, because like uh, I think like a lot of people in the LGBT community, they like from what I've seen, everyone just loves D and D so much because it's just a chance to just be who you are in this world where anything is possible, and it, it's a bit sad in term, not sad as in like the negative connotation of sad but like it's sad in a way that like they have to be in this fantasy world to finally just be comfortable and do whatever they want um Mm -hmm. like well i'm 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 bisexual um so but it's never like 
it's not as hard for me. Like, I'm just, what? Like, you get the comments, like, oh, the greedy, blah, blah. It's just spicy straight, you know? Like... <laughs> So it's uh, like obviously it's not to a level of like I don't know how uh, a trans person feels I don't know how a non-binary person feels or somebody who uh, who just doesn't feel comfortable no matter what they identify as so it, my like my experience like both my characters are completely asexual and it's not because oh. that was a conscious decision it was just a case of like I don't think either of my characters would care about sexuality. Like the first one was a pacifist barbarian who just wanted to spread the word of pacifism and like make sure he didn't lose his shit all the time. And then wow. in the chaffin, who I'm playing right now, is just too depressed and scared of the world to consider putting his putting himself out there, like trying to chat people up. He's he's mm. still got the very traditional I'm a hero, I must protect like the fair maidens and stuff but it would be a case of if he'd re- if he rescued like a princess and she threw himself at him he'd be like uh i don't care about this bye <laughs> <laughs> but i i think it like part of the appeal of D D because the reason i made a pacifist barbarian was because like i didn't think i'd like it so i could just have that out of but like i don't want to fight anymore i'm leaving <laughs> But like it's it's so it's it just allows you to be as loud as you want as loud as you want whoever you want to be. I guess I don't as much as I use Chaffinch as a proxy. The main thing like I can be as a Chaffinch that I can't be in real life is just the loud idiot. Because you can't <laughs> I can't be a loud idiot in real life, even though that is my personality. Like because too much hinges on it. If I'm too much of a loud idiot, could lose my job, right. all kinds of dumb shit. But I can just be an absolute <laughs> ass as the Chaffinch, even though he's got a heart of gold. Like he's just he's just an ass, but yeah. So like, being able to represent yourself how you want is, I think, why D and D's just surged back into popularity. I don't think it. Yeah. Obviously, we've got the legacy players who are from traditional backgrounds, so like boomers and stuff who played and like they love it, and like they've got very traditional like in their in traditional relationships, their sis, whatever. But I think mm-hmm. the, the resurgence has been down to people who are part of the LGBT community, people who are from alternative groups who like can't express themselves as much as they as they can, like on this in this game, and it, it's it's quite good. And like the whole reason I started this podcast is because I watched a documentary about people talking about like why it's so important to them, and like I, why I wanted to talk to people about the characters just to see how important they were to them and stuff like that i think it's i think it's remarkable like how it's just been brought back to prominence on the strength of people just wanting to be who they want to be within like this game setting and i think that's like been talked about in articles and and op-eds whatever it would be um like older players or or just older people that were familiar with it have talked about how it used to be you know uh, L- L- the LGBT community, like people that were in the community, people of color, uh, people that didn't subscribe to various, uh, uh, people that were not part of yeah. various oppressive groups or were part of those oppressed groups. They were the ones who were like into D&D. And then kind of the, uh, the cis white male uh, population kind of claimed it as their own and, and said, well, this is this is ours. This is our thing. Like nerd culture is a cis white male thing. Yeah. Um, so uh, and kind of pushing those people out of those circles or making those people unsafe uh, associating with that. And so it, that's another thing that makes me very happy to see kind of um, new age uh, celebration of it and celebration of yourself. Because you know people. I mean, even on Critical Role, you know those I. I don't know if any of them are LGBT, but uh, the actors themselves, their characters have been, yeah. you know, bi, uh, gay, straight, whatever it would be. Um, but it's not necessarily tied to who the the player is. The the character is something completely different. I mean, in the second season, uh, Sam Regal is playing a female character, uh, and I think that's really interesting. Yeah. And I think I think taking those deviations, playing a character that isn't your gender identity, that isn't your sexuality. I think those aren't necessarily um, bad things. I think it's cool to, I think it's cool to make your character be something different from who you are. I think it it helps build empathy. Just if you're mm-hmm. in a, if you're in a respectful group, 
that would take these characters and put them in a story that does their specific issues justice so like say if you if like we were to run a campaign right now somebody came in they wanted to play a gay character as the dm i might want to do a storyline where they get to a place that's very traditional and they don't like gays at all and then sort of you you put them in that situation to see how the the rest of the party rally around them or see how they overcome it themselves type thing and then mm-hmm. it, it just helps build empathy because one of the things i i think that contributes to a lot of ignorance in the world is just lack of common like experience so like some of these people are like ah, oh, we don't believe trans people are actually going through this thing like we can't fathom why they would think this way is because they've always been around people who are absolutely sure of who they are or right. the concept just hasn't crossed their or their friends or their family's mind but if you the more that you're around people and people can explain um their experiences you, you mm-hmm. get to learn a lot more and with D D, um it's not like a direct conversation of somebody explaining them it's people like acting out like what's happening and sometimes that makes people understand better because it's something practical they can associate with it rather than someone just telling them and they're having to take that person's word. It shouldn't be that way. But I believe that uh, D&D allows people to like act certain things out to help other people understand more. And it's sort of mm-hmm. like um, it's like when you watch like the critical Q&As and like there's people who are, are gay or they're part of any other marginalized group that are represented on the show or included like people like oh this is great like thanks for like representing us at least some some way so like we can feel included because there's a danger if like say a show like that was full of uh heteronormative people and then everyone if that's all they saw every episode for like three years people will be like ah it's full of those type of people it must be for those type of people so I think right. it, having an inclusive group and a group that's willing to explore those topics respectfully, it should never be an excuse to be like, oh, today's campaign's going to be about racism. This gives right. me the excuse to throw the N-word around. This is a role play. I think it's, um, I think it's really important to kind of highlight that in the first season of Critical Role, which or characters that they made years ago yeah. that they'd been playing in Pathfinder and then kind of transferred into fifth edition for this for this podcast. Mm-hmm. Um, they were so they were all, uh, <laughs> if not white, they were fair skinned. Yeah. Right? They weren't necessarily humans, but they were fair skinned and, and looked like white humans. And then I th- they it looks like they made a conscious effort to to deviate from that. Yeah, in uh, in their new season with you know two tieflings, uh, goblin, half orc. Uh, one of the humans being played uh, is not white. Yeah, so it's really cool to see that. Yeah, it it, it just goes back to like just including people. It's like mm-hmm. so important, and people don't. I think because people, if something doesn't affect a person directly, they don't see the value in it as much. So like right. it's whenever there's like a film comes out and they've put all the emphasis on like a woman being the lead, and like people like dudes are often like, oh, why does it matter? Like, but it's never right. mattered for you because you've always seen yourself type thing. Exactly. Like the 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 sheer amount of money that Captain Marvel made, despite all of the the negativity it was given by dudes, it was like because it wasn't. While it was it like well, I don't I don't think it was for me. I enjoyed the film regardless, but. It really wasn't right. for you, and it doesn't need to be for you. Like you can enjoy it. It's the same with Black Panther. That really wasn't for like me as a person. I still enjoyed right. the film, but I still acknowledged that wasn't for me, and it had its place and it had its purpose. And I'm not going to stand in its way. It's like it should right. be very simple to like just put something out there. It's like this is for that person. Sell. This is for that person. But it can all right. coexist in the same sort of universe. And I also kind of hate. I don't, I don't necessarily hate it, but kind of <laughs> or both white i don't really enjoy kind of the white performative like well this is why black panther is super cool this is uh or men being like this is why captain marvel is super cool yeah it's like you shouldn't have to bring validity to their character to let somebody have that like you know, like there are, how many shitty movies are there with men in them how many shitty movies are there with white people in them? It's like, regardless of whether or not you enjoy it, just 
you know, let somebody see themselves on screen and, and, and have fun with it and have a good time seeing themselves as a superhero, as the yeah. chosen one, as, you know, that person with that mantle of power. It's very cool and very, uh, very important in my opinion. And it's like, it's like a lot of the times media is set up so anyone could envision themselves in that role. And I think it's mm-hmm. some things like slip under people's radars i mean it's less prominent these days because like they've beaten the ip to death but halo like the the big appeal with halo was like no one ever saw like obviously he was he was set up as a dude but like nobody saw what he looked like like he could have been anyone underneath the, that helmet and that's why so many people across the board just liked halo because it was a case of like oh we got we get behind master chief he's a bit of a cardboard protagonist but at least he's cardboard <laughs> enough that you can self-insert and just be like, this is me clearing this spaceship full of aliens. <laughs> <laughs> but I just think um, the fact that D&D is sort of a role play and Im- improvisation, it just allows for like anything to happen. And in a world and in a realm that anything can happen, it would be sort of ignorant not to include all kinds of people and all kinds of experiences. Because right. in that case, you're just replicating the world that we live in just with like a couple of elves hanging around it's like thanks except you can blow people up with a cool little fire spell yeah and then it just becomes like that's just some weird murder fantasy you have like i want a world exactly like mine but i can throw a fireball in an innkeeper man yeah i love dnd i'm very happy that i've gotten into it and and kind of had more experience with it now because i definitely was super into it when I was younger, uh, but didn't really have kind of a way to get to actually play it. And now that's that's changed a lot. So I'm very happy. Nice. So in, with that in mind, as we sort of wind down this episode of the podcast, one thing I like to ask people right at the end is, are there any characters you've yet to play yet that you'd like to play? Do you have any like ideas brewing of like, say in the future, if one of your characters died, have you got like a great idea for your next character? Or do you want to keep that a secret? Um, I kind of haven't thought of a thought of any other character ideas. Uh, I have been talking to an old friend, yeah, from middle school, uh, who says that they're interested in playing a campaign. So we'll see what happens with that. Um, I've thought about I don't know. Thinking about it now, I'm like, well, I would like to play a barbarian or yeah. a monk. Maybe another martial class. Maybe a martial class casting a paladin perhaps uh but i i i kind of like to let it hit me when it hits me and not try and premeditate it too much yeah yeah i, I fell into the trap of premeditating it for like seven characters in the chamber ready to go like 20 i just kept <laughs> making them and i feel like i'm never gonna play any of them yeah, so, so now i'm just like but it's just cool cool the burner <laughs> i feel like if one of my characters died now i'd be like i would now that i've got several i wouldn't know which one to pick so i'd be like ah i like that one but i might get bored of that one quick i'm gonna use this one without the six barrel chamber and yeah. just slot one and you're like all right let's go i'll just make him some sort of wizard that could change himself into any of these seven personalities i've made for him <laughs> but yeah so i think believe that's the that's the end of our episodes so thanks very much for coming on mac um sure. it's been a joy i think we went over the time i had allotted for it but it's fine my episode's like 115 <laughs> minutes because i'm an egotist and i love to talk to myself but before <laughs> we go i know you, you started doing um, videos about D, so do you want to plug your youtube channel sure um it's <laughs> uh the name i put on my old gmail account uh nice. so it's shinji ikari um because I'm a fucking loser. Nice. Um, the video series itself, I'm calling uh, Proper Copper Pot, which nice. is it's off of an old, uh, uh, I guess, song, if you can call it that. Yeah. Um, one of those songs where you sing it as fast as you can. But, oh, okay. Um, you know, homebrew, brewing, coffee, whatever, because I am yeah. obsessed with having new titles. Um, so Proper Copper Proper Copper Pot by Shinji Ikari on YouTube, and I talk about um, various aspects of stuff I've homebrewed uh, for my campaign and, and kind of trying to turn that into advice to give to new DMs. That's good. All right. I also, like, get the 
stuff and links to it and put it in the description when I set the podcast cool. away. So, thank you for joining me, and that has been another episode of Character Witness. <laughs>